Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 768. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today is October 28th, 2022. All right, buckle your seatbelts. We're here for another program of Anglican Unscripted, where two people sit down in front of their screens on their computers and talk about whatever we want to talk about. There is a list of nine or ten different topics today, and we'll get to it in a minute. Before that, George, how are you doing this week? I'm doing great. Uh, tomorrow we have an Altrea, which is the Crisia reunion, and we've got several churches and groups coming to the church. Sunday night, uh, we have our monthly pet service, and because Halloween's the next day, we're having all the kids come and the pets come in costumes, so uh, it'll be a wild Episcopal Church service at 5 p.m. in Lacanto, Florida. Just, you know, the season's picking up. Last night, we had 50-plus people at a parish dinner at a local restaurant. Just, you know, the life, the woof and whim of being a parish priest, it's a wonderful way to live. It really is. Sure. It's a lot of well, fun. I kind of raced back here to get back to Florida a little early this season because I had doctor's appointments. I'm of the age now where I have to see more than one doctor more than once a year. Um, and if people remember back in April, I had kidney stones and I was hospitalized and they took the stones out. And at the same time, they found gallstones and they said, after this RV season, you come back here and we need to take those out. So I went and saw the surgeon on Wednesday, and he said, it's not that bad. They're not, it's asymptomatic. You don't need your gallstones out. And then I went to see the urologist this morning. He said, you know, your kidney stones, I, they're not as bad as they looked before. You don't need to have the rest of them taken out. They'll probably all come up by themselves. So like, Great. And so I'm back in Florida. George is back in Florida. We're going to do the show. But you guys need to, to understand. Uh, I wanted to pull up here uh, a, a conversation George and I had here on... Uh, WhatsApp. This is a, a normal conversation between George and I. Can you film at 1030? That's today, Friday. I said, maybe noon. Uh, done with my ur urologist. I should be home by 1130 a.m. Uh, George says, well, I have a flu shot at 1215. Can we get together at 1245? You know, if that's not text between two old people, I don't know what is, George. <laughs> that's life in Florida. Yeah, And I bet you went in at 1215 and you had to wait. Oh yeah, I waited until 12.45, and that's when they started. Not, uh, not when my appointment began, but when uh, our time together was supposed to begin. But hey, okay. it's done. So, let's, uh, talk, let's talk border crossing wars, George. We have, for the longest time since the formation of the ACNA, talked about the Church of Nigeria, the Church of Uganda, the Church of Kenya, and how they were formational in the cornerstone process of helping found in Rwanda the ACNA. They were there to help us out early on before the formation of the ACNA by providing cover for our bishops and churches and uh, they were there for great oversight. And then one by one they let go. Church of Uganda let go of the bishops that they appointed so they could join the ACNA. Church of Kenya did the same. Church of Rwanda said go, go, go. But the Church of Nigeria held on and said, no, no, we we like the dice we've rolled and we're going to build a kingdom in America as well. And it was pointed out to them by myself, you, certainly members of the ACNA, that the ACNA is a strong Orthodox presence here in America. And we're doing just fine. We're here to plant a thousand churches. Um, we're growing and we don't really have any doctrinal issues that the Church of Nigeria needs to worry about. In fact, our Archbishop is so good and powerful and smart and wise, they made him the head of GAFCON. So there shouldn't be any problem here. And I probably complained about it maybe once or too many times uh, about three years ago, and I started getting some angry email from some bishops in these uh, um, Church of Nigeria uh, American-based dioceses. Now things have changed. In fact, radically, in one week, um, we're learning that Bishop Felix Orgy has moved from the Church of Nigeria to the ACNA. And he has uh, penned a letter explaining why he did this. And I'm like, you know, you kind of wrote me some nasty emails when I complained about this two years ago. Let's see what you have to say now, George. 
There are two competing visions about what the Chuncha Nigeria is doing in the United States. The first is that laid down when it was founded by Archbishop Peter Akinola, which is we are part of the team providing a lifeboat for faithful Anglicans until they can launch their own ship. Mm -hmm. And this is what was how the uh, Martin Mins and the uh, uh, Cana, the original convocation of Anglicans in North America, uh, was set up. And that grew, and Felix Orgy took over from Martin Mins, and Felix expanded it into a number of dioceses, Diocese of the West, Diocese of the Trinity. Um, and the new primates, there was another primate, and now the new primate, Henry Ndekuba, has a different vision, which is a Nigerian beachhead, basically a church for ethnic Nigerians in the United States. And I haven't spoken to Bishop Orji on this point, but I think he was torn because he came up through the Akinola vision, and which was a church for all people, uh, tied to the Church of Nigeria for apostolic and uh, orders and preservation of sound doctrine. And he saw it before his eyes changing into a ethnic church. And he basically finally said, I, this is not what uh, I signed up for. So whether there was internal strife of within the church of Nigeria, different factions, uh, if you will, an Akinola faction and a Kuba faction, I don't know. I'm not saying there is, but Felix Orgy is essentially sounding the tune that his critics were sounding a few years ago when this issue was made real. Uh, but on October 23rd, and the, the difficult thing is the Church of Nigeria is not letting go. On October 23rd, they penned a letter which was released uh, by uh, one of their news outlets saying that uh, Bishop Orgy's been suspended and uh, one of the suffragans is now in charge. So they're holding on to their uh, structures. They're not letting go. And we asked the ACNA, well, do you have any comment earlier in the week? We've not gotten a response. And I can imagine why, because Foley B just basically massaged the Church of Nigeria, as well as do the right thing towards Felix Orgy. And they're not the same thing. Uh, the Church of Nigeria <laughs> wants, wants Felix to be swatted down and to mm -hmm. basically come back on his knees, and Felix wants to continue the, the work of the ministry of his diocese. So we'll see how this plays itself out. Yeah, it's, it's certainly strange, uh, and I wouldn't want to be in uh, Felix Orgy's position having to serve two masters, and he's chosen one, mm -hmm. yeah, which is good. And it, um, it's it's difficult that we've come this far into the maturity of the ACNA and we have to deal with border crossing. We have to deal with a province who won't let go of the, the kingdom they're building. And, uh, you know, I think the ACNA is strong enough now uh, that it may want to exert some power and say, no, not here. You know, so, all right. That story is good. I got to find my notes. I've lost my show notes. Uh, there are some new bishops appointed in the Church of England. I thought we could talk about that, George. Yeah, one of our regular uh, correspondents, uh, people who write to us and sort of gives us tips and news about the Church of England, has said, have you fellows looked into the last four Episcopal appointments? You'll see a pattern here. Uh, the Church of England recently announced uh, four new bishops. The first is Helen Ann Hartley. She's a young woman in her, I think, mid to late 40s. And she was moved from a suffragan bishop to become Bishop of Newcastle. And Helen Ann Hartley was ordained in 2006 and was a curate for four years. Then she taught in some minor theological positions, colleges. And then she went out to New Zealand to be Dean of English Studies at a New Zealand university. And then two years after that, she was ordained a bishop and was translated to the UK as a suffragan and is now a diocesan bishop. Helen Ann Hartley, in 16 years of ordained ministry, has never been a parish rector. She's never, she has, you know, the vast, but except for four years a curate, four years as a curate, she's never been a parish priest. Um, Joe Bailey Wells, uh, who was recent, recently announced as the 
uh, bishop to the bishops uh, in uh, 26 years of ministry has never been a parish priest. She's always been a chaplain. She's never been a curate. She's been the Archbishop of Canterbury's chaplain. She's had admin jobs. She's had college chaplaincy's jobs. And now she's been appointed to be bishop to the bishops. And she has no experience of actually being uh, a parish priest. Uh, John Perumbaleth was appointed Bishop of Liverpool. He's from North India. Now, he has had parish experience, but in, 12, in 27 years of ordained ministry, only 12 of those was in the parish. The rest was in academic and uh, administrative jobs. So what's the pattern here? Um, and then the fourth one is a man named Stephen Race. Race, let me make sure I got it. Stephen Race. He is the new Bishop of Beverly, which is the flying bishop for Anglo-Catholics in the province of York. In 25 years of, par of ordained ministry, guess what? He's been a parish priest for 25 years. There was a TV show that, if you look back on it, is prescient. Probably the most well-written English comedy I've ever seen it was called Yes, Prime Minister, Yes, Minister. Yes. Great, great. And there's an episode about called The Bishop's Gambit about appointing bishops in the Church of England. They do things a little differently now, but in up until 2007, the Prime Minister chose one of two candidates put forward by the Church of England. And Sir Humphrey, or whether it was Bernard Woolley, the assistant, basically made the observation uh, the, the Prime Minister, Jim Hacker, had to choose between somebody who had a lot of parish experience and who had no experience, but had been uh, bishop's chaplain, uh, leader, you know, in this group, in that group. And the comment was, oh, to be a bishop, being in a parish is something you want to avoid at all costs. And it was played for a laugh 30 years ago, but it really is true. Well, it's the reality now. Listen, if I w had dreams of moving up into the hierarchy of the Church of England, would I be a parish priest for uh, 30 years? moving to a couple of different parishes, moving up the, the political ladder? No, I'd want to do something where I was high profile, academia, or whole pro high profile, already, you know, a little choir boy of the uh, uh, Canterbury. So that's that's where you're going to get your, uh, uh, your career proficiency from, George. Yeah, and we, we see this in the Episcopal Church too, of of uh, what I would call token bishops, bishops appointed for gender reasons or race reasons or good old fashioned Diversi parish. diversity appointments. Diversity, yes. diversity, inclusion, what's the E stand for? D I E, or whatever, equity. Yeah. Um, the uh, part of the problem with the church is that we have no real leaders, we have no real people who have been in the trenches done the hard work, but also have that charism of Episcopal ministry, which the Lord has given them. I don't see many, if any, in the Episcopal Church right now. Um, in my own diocese, we have three candidates for for bishop. One has spent his entire, one has never been a parish, parish rector. One is in his 60s and is a retread, second career guy who's only been ordained 10 years. And the third, is from the Diocese of Colorado, where he's been at the same parish for 20 years. Well, Central Florida always elects somebody local, but this time around we may elect somebody who actually has done the work of parish ministry. But the search committee basically is playing a three-card Monty trick. Pick a card, any card, so long it's the bishop's assistant, who's never actually been a parish priest, but who's uh, been uh, in everybody's uh, backyard for eight years. And we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, we know what's going to happen. I mean, uh, people who want to get ahead are going to uh, develop a reason not to become a parish priest. Uh, we have news also from the but Church see, of Kevin, England. But see, Kevin, that is, so, uh, if I may I know. interject, <laughs> there, is, there is no better life to lead than as a parish priest. Mm -hmm. The degree of mm -hmm. spiritual satisfaction, emotion, emotional fulfillment, I mean, this is a job where you get up every morning. It, well, it's not a job. You get up every morning and look forward to what you're going to do. Um, it really is a. It is the greatest gift I've ever been given. Um, 
I don't want the vestry to know this, but I'd actually pay money to have this job. <laughs> because, well, not because I'm so well paid or this or that, but because you just l are living in God's world, doing God's work. And in the what world better way to be than that? Yeah, in the world and not of the world. And you know, we live in this strange realm where uh, I have parish priests who've been passed over to be bishop. I don't care. I, I got my parish. I know people in academia who all they ever wanted to do was be bishop, get passed over, and they're, you know, on, on suicide watch. And that's kind of the difference, you know, of a, a parish life versus an academic life when your goal uh, is to serve it'd be the shepherd or your goal is to be uh, in, in purple so all well, right so I many, think we'd be there's so many bad bishops and so many bad clergy yeah. that uh, hmm. we just the church just does a really poor job Church of England the Episcopal Church the Catholic Church in picking leaders of God's church well, you mentioned that the prime minister picks the bishops. They don't do that anymore because we have, don't they have a Hindu prime minister now as head of the UK? Yes, a, uh, uh, they have a Hindu who's now the leader of the Conservative Party and has now become the prime minister of Great Britain. And there's been some ill-informed uh, commentary saying, oh my goodness, a Hindu is going to pick bishops for the Church of England. Don't do that anymore. Well, in 2007, Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister, uh, who was the son of a Church of Scotland uh, minister and actually was an atheist himself, Gordon Brown said, I'm going to change the way we do things. Instead of you giving me two choices and I pick one and give it to the Queen, you just give me one choice and I'll just hand over that choice to the Queen for approval. So beginning in 2007, the Prime Minister's role became purely uh, Functionary. In other words, he just took from the church to the queen the church's choice. So since 2007, uh, now any prime minister can undo that and That's basically res take back the power that Gordon Brown gave up. But uh, the new prime minister, uh, who is a beef eating Hindu, which if uh, says what sort of Hindu he is. He's uh, not he an Orthodox Hindu. Hindu. Okay, yes. Well, he's a cultural Hindu, and uh, right. I'm sure when he goes to his parents' house, he doesn't have a hamburger, but he's happy to have the roast beef with the boys at, on a night out. Sure. Um, but for him, uh, he is an... Um, it's just not something I would particularly worry about because the same crappy system that gives us the current Church of England bishops is in place. And now you just have a different person handing out the envelope from point A to point B. All right, next bit of news. The uh, city of Brighton uh, over in England has decided to have death zones. I, they call it something else, but basically you're not allowed to give a sign of a cross or pray or do anything that would hinder a person from getting an abortion um it's kind of like a, a temple mount in, in the middle of brighton where you you're just not allowed to express anything in terms of your christianity george england is not america and in england when there is freedom of speech freedom of religion always is subordinated to political authority and here the Brighton City Council, which is, Brighton is sort of Britain's Castro District or Key West, as a yes. dis disproportionately high number of gay uh, residents. And it's also a very progressive city. And their city council has basically said, we need to have these zones around abortion clinics where these nasty Christians can't make the sign of the cross, can't pray in public, can't do anything that might dissuade a person from not having an abortion. The They didn't really think this one through. They basically are uh, saying that there are no prayer zones now in England. There are no crossing yourself zones. There are zones where we can forbid the free exercise of religion and speech in the name of a greater religion, which is murdering uh, unborn children. Oof, <laughs> I just like 
Oh, George. All right. So uh, other now, this isn't yeah. this isn't a national, and I don't know if this. Uh, I don't think the English system is parallel to the Americans, where they can have a test case and somebody can sue and this and that. They might somebody might seek legal review, but in Britain, uh, you basically have to pay for your lawsuit as you go along. You just can't sort of uh, have a contingency fee, and so that sort of pushes back these public interest lawsuits that we have in the United States. Uh, we don't have we do, you don't have those as frequently in the UK. Well, here in America, we would have some type of riot or protest where a a bunch of Christians would go into that zone and display uh, piety in, in many different forms. I don't know if well, they it's, do it's that. Like, it's like the things that happen in California where uh, David Jeremiah, who's a TV minister, very popular, uh, refused to do Gavin uh, Newsom's, uh, uh, you know, the liquor store is allowed to be open across the street, but uh, David Jeremiah's church had to close. And he yes. says, no, I'm not going to do it. And so the county sheriffs came over and gave him tickets and fined him ten thousand dollars a day or something like that. And David Jeremiah engaged lawyers, and it went up, and he won. He won the lawsuit yeah. because it was uh, infringement of uh, speech and infringement of religion, which the uh, the state has no authority to do. It doesn't matter if Gavin Newsom thinks that the the COVID at that time is worse than the plague. I'm sorry, you do not have the right to impose your now pseudo-scientific worldview on others. Yeah. You don't have a right to improve, impose your religion, if you will, uh, wokeness on others. Now, it's the same thing. We had, a, we, had a, like, we had another case out of California where a woman was, was, was sued for not baking a lesbian wedding cake. And the courts basically found that, you know, you cannot be compelled to engage in speech. Um, freedom of speech is freedom of speech as well as freedom not to speak over in Scotland I think it was two or three years ago uh, Franklin Graham went to speak and uh, the Scottish people or the the, the, the lawyers and law, uh, law people at the time said you can't speak here and he just recently won in Scottish court over that now Scotland doesn't have freedom of uh, speech laws like we have in America here either but uh, the Scottish courts were pretty harsh on the people who said that uh, Franklin Graham can't give a, a conference here, George. Yeah, it was a city council. It was in a city-owned facility. I think it was a Glasgow, or it might have been Edinburgh. I'm, I don't remember. Uh, okay. But yeah. if Franklin Graham had a UK tour, and the uh, city council said, well, Franklin Graham is opposed to gay marriage, and we're all for it. Therefore, we're going to forbid him from using any of our city properties or facilities. Mm -hmm. Well, this viewpoint discrimination uh, violated uh, uh, the European uh, human rights laws, I believe. And uh, Graham won, I think, he won a paltry sum, 75,000 pounds, plus, I think, court costs, which is the big thing. Now, that's the other the side thing, has, yeah. to pay, has to pay Graham's lawyers. Essentially, what it's saying is that city councils in Scotland, at any rate, um, cannot decide which uh, religious groups, which uh, groups they may or may not support. Um, but th there's a great deal of hypocrisy in England, especially in the Church of England on this point. The Church of England will say that uh, the General Synod a year or two ago said no member of the uh, I forget what it's called, but it used to be the National Front, uh, extreme, extreme right, maybe a member, no cl clergy person, maybe a member of an extreme right wing organization. Because even though they may not say anything or do anything by their very act of being member of a group that promulgates something we think is contrary to God's law, they're bringing the ministry in disrepute. We ought now read this past week, there are a thousand clergy who have said that they will do gay marriages, and there are clergy who are members of groups that promulgate uh, items, uh, doctrines that are contrary to the Church of England rules and, and God's laws written. And the only people who get slapped down are political conservatives. If the, In other words, if you use that logic, you can't have a member of an extreme political group uh, be a member of uh, be in the clergy then how do you allow these gay activists to be members of the clergy 
they're not saying anything they're not doing anything well if neither are the uh, extreme conservatives but hey hypocrisy is not new in english life and certainly not in the church of england no i think the uh can't i think the archbishop of canterbury should have spoken out about the death zones and said no that's not right we as a church do not allow uh, ourselves to be kowtowed by city governments who won't let us uh, give the sign of a cross or pray. That's that's silly. He gave no uh, reaction problem at all to speak- that, nor did Ch- problem- Church of the England. problem with speaking out is that it often makes you look like an extreme hypocrite. The Washington National Cathedral decided to speak out about Kanye West, or Ye Jeez. West, as he's now called. Whatever Kanye that. West uh, had yeah. some, uh, I think it was tweets, that were uh, viewed as being anti-Semitic. I'm not defending him. No, no, but horrible. the National Cathedral put out this, we need to stand firm against anti-Semitism. Wait a minute. Nas- <laughs> Wait a minute. The National Cathedral has got Il- Ilan Omar, you know, it, it, it depends. Kanye West is now seen as a Trump supporter, so we'll speak out against him when he goes anti-Semitic. Well, when all the Democrats uh, in Congress become anti-Semitic, uh, or uh, they are perfectly silent. So it's a problem speaking out. You need to be consistent. Otherwise, you look like the Washington National Cathedral, upper hip- utter hypocrite and picking targets of opportunity that coincide with your political philosophies rather than truly being concerned about anti-Semitism. Diocese of Vermont is in the news. Uh, They recently had their uh, diocesan convention and they demanded, I don't think they passed this, but part of the conversation was we wanted to demand that tech withdraw all front funds, monies, and support from the ACC, the next Lambeth, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, because of how poorly uh, the last Lambeth was to the LGBTQ community and the spouses of current gay bishops. How dare they? And I'm like, Mm -hmm. you guys got a bug up your butt because you kind of won the last Lambeth. They don't think so, Kevin. I know, but Justin Welby equated the teaching of uh, creation and marriage from the Bible as the zeitgeist of the day marriage. He, they're the same, he says. Why, are you, why is Vermont upset, George? Well, I'll answer a different question. Okay. Lambeth is history if you've got yes. the left calling for it to be defunded, as well as the Global South and GAFCON saying we're never going back. Who's left? Yes. Just the corporatists in the Church of England. Diocese of Vermont had a resolution saying, until unless the Anglican world gets rid of Lambeth 110, the statement on human sexuality, unless it allows the partnered uh, spouse, the spouses of partnered gay and lesbian clir- bishops to attend Lambeth, and unless it wholeheartedly jumps into support of full equality of gays and lesbian in the lives of the church in every province of the world, then we are going to ask the General Convention to withhold its annual contributions to the ACC and any ongoing Anglican bodies. And that, this coming year, 2023, is going to be about $350,000. Well, well, they had debate, and part of the debate was, well, we really can't, the Lambeth Conference invitations of the Archbishop of Canterbury, and that's 10 years off. So let's sort of focus our attention on Lambeth 110. And we'll hold our fire and discuss this for the coming year. And then our next convention will vote on this so that we can present it to the next general convention of the Episcopal Church. Fairly confident that the next Lambeth Vermont convention will have this. And in the meantime, its sponsors will get some other liberal dioceses to co-sponsor it. And so the next general convention will be faced with a call to cut $350,000 a year out of the budget uh, and use it for supporting gay rights in the United States. And I got to tell you, Kevin, that is very exciting news for the general convention that we don't have to pay <laughs> protection money to Prote- land it. Yeah. Yeah. Because, but- you know, the, the, the Diocese of Central Florida has got to kick up, you know, that amount of money each year about to the national church. and. If we've got an excuse not to do it, we'll take it in a heartbeat. 
uh, that must that must be it, it the money because uh, Vermont your side won the new dean of Canterbury Cathedral is a man living with another man in a same sex relationship oh but he's chaste no he's not please they have twin beds no no now the Church of <laughs> England in an unnamed, uh. unsigned statement put out by ACNS, so you know it was written by the ACNS, it's not a real statement, it's just written out of peak. Um, basically says the GAFCON and GS, Global South primates, don't know what they're talking about, they don't understand England. And these two men, they have twin beds, they don't have one king bed, that they are living, they don't understand the rules which say that you must be chaste in your civil partnership. Uh, they don't identify what chaste means. That means you have only have sex within the relationship or you have sex with anybody who you see. Is that chastity? Yeah. What is chastity? <laughs> or is it celibacy? And the problem is our correspondents, our friends in the Diocese of Leicester, where this uh, new dean came from, where he was dean, was quite open in the fact that his relationship was not in conformance. With and it should and it standards. shouldn't have to be. I mean, you shouldn't have to hide this. I mean, mm -hmm. the Archbishop of Canterbury has chosen your side. You should not have to tell people you're chaste. Don't lie about that. You need to stand firmly and say, "No, we're not chaste, and we have the Archbishop of Canterbury's support." You know, shame well, on the, you for having new, to lie about that. Well, the new Dean of Canterbury has somehow managed to get all of his uh, trail erased from the internet. To uh, take one. <laughs> you know, where he spoke at a conference uh, about uh, marriage and gay marriage and his support for it, his audio is gone. Uh, so, but the church, it just says how stupid the Church of England response was because it basically it will set the wheels in motion until somebody finds a tape somewhere and says, gotcha. Here he is on tape explaining how his arrangement works and how he thinks this is godly. Because what you've done is basically say, here's the lie, and we're going to stand by the lie. And that just causes you to be set up to be shown that the lie is a fraud. And it's hypocrisy, because they would not allow the same for a dean of the cathedral to live with his girlfriend or his civil partner. Because, well, they say it's chaste. <sighs> okay, uh, you know, it just... We, we live in a very strange time, George. Let's move on to some more news. Uh, I think Yeah, we reported on the report on the Diocese of the Midwest that, uh, that kind of exonerated uh, certainly Bishop Stuart Ruck, and he has announced uh, with the support of Archbishop Foley Beach, he's going to return to work as bishop. And uh, that's getting a little bit of a playback around certainly the internet George Facebook and and Twitter but I was disappointed to read the headline of the uh, religious news service in this uh, that they kept picking at a scab so to speak I just go back to that scene in the movie Animal House where John Belushi smashes the guitar of the folk singer and then when it's done he says Sorry. And sorry. Uh, <laughs> essentially, <laughs> essentially, the ACNA said to uh, Stuart Ruck, sorry, after smashing his career. And part of the smash was uh, allowing uh, special interest groups who, who basically want to crucify somebody. And the higher up the chain they are, that's great. Uh, they allowed them to drive a lot of the conversation. Um, well, I think halfway through that, you know, once they realized the conversation was being driven and it was completely out of control, there was a lot of pushback, but they had to do so behind the scenes. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, because we don't want to be seen as interfering here. We don't, we want this process to play out in a very public way, a very transparent way, so everybody sees the results. Yeah, they did that, but there's like, there's one side who has a megaphone and the ACA's communications office says, we don't have a megaphone and we want the process to work out properly. Therefore, we're going to keep our lips closed until this is done. That, and that's fair. Uh, because when it, was on, uh, well, when it was done, it was a fair report uh, that showed that there was no malice here in what happened in the Diocese of the Midwest, George. Upper Midwest. Kevin, if you can remember, Ronald Reagan had a labor secretary who was uh, uh, 
uh, charged and accused of uh, political corruption. He was from New Jersey, or, and uh, mm -hmm. and he went through all of the trials, and he was found not guilty, and it was found to be prosecutorial zealousness and this and that, and, it, and there was never any fire there. And and when it was all over and he was exonerated, uh, one of the things he said to the news media is, where do I go to get my reputation back? What department do I go to to get my reputation back? Absolutely. And, and Stuart Ruck can ask that same question. Uh, and, you know, the, it's not like the ACNA did something wrong by investigating and doing due diligence, but rather we had these excitable groups throwing out accusations, throwing out emotional statements, and not allowing the system to do its work. And, well, I hate to say it, but it's a broken system uh, when you have someone who's actually a winner still come out as a loser. Yeah, well, it's a broken system because there will never be a winner in this type of situation, George. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, clearly the ACNA didn't have a really good format for what do you do when something like this happens. And the diocese didn't have an idea what what list of things, give us a list of 10 things we, that we need to do when something happens like this. And there was, it's a young, immature organization. Sometimes I say it's AC and it's mature because it is mature in so many different ways. Here, they, they, they hopefully have learned a good, clean lesson about having to, uh, some rules together when somebody is accused of something as heinous as this was. And um, we're going to step back and hopefully as a province learn from this. Because if, if you can get this right, you're going to get something right that the Roman Catholics never got right, that the Episcopal Church never got right, the Lutherans struggle with, the, the United... I mean, nobody's got this right. Let ACNA set itself aside and be the one province denomination place that gets this right. How we handle... Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, horrid situations where it can be redeemed by God. So that's that's my say. But we got a follow up. We uh, Bishop uh, Breedlove uh, released a, a further report about uh, Dan Clare and what's been happening there as an update. And because Bishop Breedlove is my bishop uh, or former bishop, I. You know, George, I tell you this all the time. The safest people to be on Anglican Scripture is our bishops because we're not going to talk to you about it. I'm going to kind of defer this to George, George. Well, there was accusations against the priest, and the bishop made a misstep because when the first accusation came to him, he cited the biblical injunction that you needed two witnesses, hmm. which I think was a mistake. He didn't actually begin the process laid out in canonically. He responded as if he was a parish priest getting gossip rather than as a bishop with an allegation of misconduct by his clergy. And then an investigatory team was formed after sufficient evidence was brought forward uh, stating there might be a case. And the investigators didn't focus on facts, they focused on a psychological evaluation of the clergy person. Which And so when they got the report back, there was no there there in the report. There was no, we found that on this date, this happened, and this happened, and this happened. So now we're in a position where if this guy is perfectly clear, no, you can't go forward, you can't go back. Basically, the, the uh, pond is so muddied that there's no way of proving or disproving. The priest is left high and dry. The uh, bishop can't get closure. And those who uh, may or may not have been uh, subject to inappropriate behavior can't get closure. Um, this again is a question, if you stick to the procedures, you don't get these crappy outcomes. Yeah. Again, and this, you know, this is an example of, well, let me be pastoral and try to fix this. You, you can't fix these things. You have to follow a system. Once you've set it up, just follow it and don't allow your your heart or your emotions to, be, to, to, to dissuade you from following what you should do. This is a point where y you make assumptions based on your faith that mm -hmm. uh, really can screw you up further down the road. Mm -hmm. and you need to be so very careful, follow the procedure, because you can always default to, I follow the procedure. 
Mm -hmm. it was, it, and it's in place to do this, and this is the result we got. And, you know, I will hark on this forever. <laughs> to, go to the rule book. <laughs> go to the 10 steps how to get myself out of this jam. Oh, George. All right, so let's move. Oh, in the news. Now, I have not heard any news from uh, this person in a long time, but presiding bishop Michael Curry uh, went to Georgetown University and gave a speech. Now, if you go to any university in 2022 and ask them what topics do they want you to speak about as the presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church, mm -hmm. I'm betting prayer is not on the top. Uh, relationship with Jesus won't make the top 10. Uh, you know god's effect on humanity you know creation you're not gonna... white nationalism was probably be the one thing they want to hear about george what do you think yeah uh michael curry was asked to speak at a round table on white christian nationalism and oh, essentially bishop curry uh got to say that it's the greatest threat to american democracy today not cancel culture, not, uh, not, Elon, not, Musk. The, not Elon Musk, <laughs> not the arrest of, uh, of abortion protesters by the FBI. None of that stuff is the greatest threat to American democracy, not all the elect electoral shenanigans. But some guy living in a hut on a mountainside in Idaho, that's the greatest threat to American democracy. Oh, on one hand, I'm sort of happy that Michael Curry can be so easily distracted from talking about real important issues and be allowed to uh, blovate on something that is you know, yeah i mean it, it, in it's fact the only, pe the only people talking about presiding bishop michael curry's uh, round table after he spoke about it is unscripted it didn't make any national papers it didn't get go anywhere my greatest fear was he would get up and speak about the evils of pregnancy centers so no, but, no, but see, see, in other words, uh, it's just white. The threat, the, the the statement that white Christian nationalism is the greatest threat to American democracy is ludicrous. It is from an adult mind that has no grasp of reality or sense of what is true or untrue. It's it's a religious statement. It's a faith statement. It has no. It can't be proven. It can't be disproven. It can't be defined. It's just what you want to be true. And on one hand, I'm happy that Michael Curry will waste his time and waste the liberals' time going down this dead end. But just think what we could have if we had bishops in our church who could speak to the risen Lord Jesus Christ with equal fervor about the need to evangelize, the need to win souls for Christ, not the uh, uh, fantastical ravings of uh, the threat uh, of white Christian nationalists. Um, who's you know who's beating up all the Asians in San Francisco? Who's yeah. pushing people onto the subways in New York City? Who's shooting black teenagers in Chicago? Um, it, you know, this is the Jesse Smollett where white Christian nationalists came and put a noose on him. You know, on the south side of Chicago, there were Trump supporters which I think is impossible to begin with. Well, it is impossible. <laughs> In other words, it's the same degree of mental lunacy gymnastics that Jussie Smollett got the, the woke world to believe. Um, and Michael Curry is buys this. I mean... Well, he buys it, well, and he, but he doesn't buy it. He's reselling it as well. Mm -hmm. You remember, and right after Trump was elected, there were all these little hate crimes going on around our nation. And when they finally investigated them, they found that they were done by liberals who were painting mm -hmm. these uh, hate uh, graffiti on stuff like that, breaking stained glass windows in churches, burning out cars. It wasn't Trump supporters. Trump supporters were too busy having their own fun, but they weren't being the violent uh, racist that um, the liberals wanted. And so they had you know, to, to create these hate crimes. And there was a yeah, website at the time that tracked each story and its conclusion and which person went to jail, paid a fine, and stuff like that. It's no longer there because, well, they don't need it. But uh, there's just yeah, not enough. Cool. There's not a, enough. The, the demand for racism has outstripped the demand 
to have for the racist it, it, the supplies man and supply supplies. problem we don't have enough That's it. we don't have enough white racists to go around yeah. to meet the needs of the woke you know yeah. in the episcopal church we had a church in suburban indianapolis i think it was that was vandalized with heil hitlers and maggots all this and that and it turned out to be the organist a gay man who wanted to provoke and raise consciousness of the threat by trump and his supporters he vandalized his own church but until the sheriff's department finally caught him by tracking his cell phone and yep. here he was at 1 a.m what was it what was his phone pinging from the church for uh the, the diocese of indianapolis was oh woe is us we're under the we're under the guns of the ku klux klan and republicans and this and that that was all a fraud and time and again these things are frauds now again uh, we're not saying that, that there isn't a christian nationalist somewhere but usually they're like in idaho or in alaska oh, no. or so th like. they're here the, uh, to be honest i live in florida you live in florida the florida man story that you see in the paper is usually led by a person who has that belief system you know he's the type of guy who likes to hunt alligators in the afternoon go out drinking with the guys at night wears the wife beater t-shirt hasn't showered in three weeks they're out they're out there george but they don't have any power they don't have any influence you yeah, know but it's, we've got over 30 million people in florida you're going to have and you're going to have all sorts of odds and sods yeah but the problem is the people who are on the ultra left have the influence they're the professors at the universities they're the people who are getting the speaking gigs going around this country they're the people of influence on facebook and TikTok and uh twitter and other places the 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 horrid voice of this nation has influence where these white christian nationalists all 10 of them don't have any influence in you george well, I, I'll challenge you slightly by saying, look how many people, Michael Curry, the head of the African-American head of the Protestant Episcopal Church of the USA, the nation's, uh, if you will, most socially prestigious or most uh, prominent, you know, we still get covered by the New York Times and all that stuff. Ooh, ooh. Nobody cares what Michael Curry says, not even the New York Times and the Washington Post man goes to georgetown university you'd think at least the washington post would run with this story eh, they may eventually get around to it yeah. if they have a need for a race story coming up but michael the michael curry's and the justin welby's have so debased the currency of their reputations and of the church that nobody cares hmm. i'm kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 768 of Anglican Unscripted.